you guys know um, a company called Gojek? Anyone? I know you, you would know from Gojek for sure. They build the entire ecosystem themselves. The entire ecosystem. Anything that you want is on Gojek. They released their wallet, and then I'm going to build what Henry said earlier about hodlers holding the tokens. The, release, the moment that they release the wallet, everyone wants to own that coin in there. Yes, there are 24 million wallets out there. I think the number is minuscule, if you put it in real perspective. How many of you have more than one wallet? So I don't think that's a 24 million users out there either. I myself hold five different wallets. And projects like Eden Chain, Quark Chain, RSK, it is impossible to get hold of supply in these ones. The valuations on these ones is like, first of all, you can't get supply. So there's no supply. You can't get token. If you want to get a supply on these ones, and we were lucky enough to get it, some of them, in, at earlier stages, now these projects are going at 35x after pre-investment, pre-ICO stage. 35x. So yes, in the days of Facebook, I completely agree. But the valuations, that, that, that journey has changed a lot. And I do concur with Henry that he is saying that it isn't at a stage where it is going to be. Where I beg to defer or to have a different opinion is that the acceleration rate is no longer the same what Facebook had or what other companies had in that time. Thanks to Facebook, thanks to Telegram, thanks to other channels, which has changed the entire valuation model. So to build on this one, our next guest, Henry Elder, would be able to discuss furthermore because the next biggest chapter, which we also got a panel later on, is about the ICOs and security tokens. So I would welcome Henry to come on stage and talk about the digital assets and the security tokens valuations. Thank you. Thank you. After all, don't put your blame on me. Hello, everyone. My name is Henry Elder. I'm the co-founder of Digital Asset Advisors. You can think of me as Henry II, following Henry I, think, talking about similar topics. But uh, I'm going to delve a little bit deeper into uh, the technicalities. So valuing crypto assets, this is a really interesting field, right? It all sort of starts with this equation called the equation of exchange, MV equals PT. M being the, being the monetary base, V being the velocity, which Henry won, mentioned earlier. Uh, P, is, <clears throat> P is the price of goods or services that are trading in an economy. And T is the number of transactions. We can also think of it as PT being the real economy, right? A, a GDP, effectively. Whereas MV is the monetary economy, right? The monetary policy and how that affects, uh, how that works in concert with the real economy. Um, when you're trying to figure out how to use this to value an individual token, that M can be further broken down. In a tokenized economy, right, you have a total capitalization of the tokens. Uh, and the total capitalization is effectively just the price of the token multiplied by the number of the tokens, right? That gets you M. So if you solve for M, you can effectively solve for what the price of a token should be at any given point in time. Now, I could just leave it there, right? I mean, that's the equation. You guys can figure it out. And I could just leave and go back home to LA where it's three in the morning and I'm extremely tired. But if you look above, you'll see the total capitalization of all crypto assets for the last six months, right? Incredible volatility. $250 billion to $800 billion, back down to $250 billion, and now we're somewhere around $350 billion, right? If it's so simple to price these tokens, then why do we have such volatility? Well, that's because the value of tokens today 
is irrational, right? It doesn't depend purely upon the actual GDP of those tokenized economies. It depends upon future expectation of the utility value of those tokens, right? It's, uh, it's speculation. It's FOMO. It's uh, 50,000 people in a telegram saying, this is big, or when Lambo. So in order to try to sort through all of that, I want to take a step away from the MP, uh, the MV equals PT, and take a step away from the FOMO and away from all of that and try to leave you guys with a qualitative and quantitative analysis that can give you a better idea of what assets to invest in. I can't tell you when, right? That's technical analysis. That's a little bit different, and that doesn't necessarily give you a value. Technical analysis can help you pick enter and exit points for specific assets. What I want to do is help you understand which ones are actually worthy of performing technical analysis on, which ones are worthy of you actually spending the time on them. So on the qualitative side, <clears throat> I think it's important to start with the white paper, right? If you're not reading the white paper, you can't call yourself an investor. You're just speculating. You're just there with the, the rest of the people who are FOMOing. They see the 35 X's and they're like, I wanna get in on this, and they just put their money, whatever Reddit's screaming the loudest that day. You have to start with the white paper. From there, you need to look at the age and the network effect, right? How long has this token been, how long has this asset been in existence? And what's the network effect? Has it seen user adoption? Is it penetrating the industry that it's uh, expected to? After that, you can look at developer activity and community involvement. How active is the GitHub? What's the quality of the community? Once you take a look at these things, you can also then move on to the quantitative side of it, right? That's where the MV equals PT comes in. Supply and demand, like Henry One was saying, at the end of the day, these are supply and demand economics. They're limited assets. There's only a certain number of them that exist in many of these uh, uh, tokenization schemes. And so therefore, if you can stimulate demand, if it's uh, a product that can create a truly competitive advantage, uh, then it should be able to outpace supply, and therefore, it will go up. Velocity, Henry One also touched on. The less velocity that there is in a tokenized economy, the higher the value is. Because at the end of the day, the value is divided by the velocity. So if you're dividing it by one, you have a higher value than you would have if you're dividing it by five, 10, 50, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that every tokenized asset should have low velocity. Some of them need a high velocity in order to function. And some of them try, <clears throat> excuse me, try to build in uh, what I like to think of as velocity sinks, which are sort of artificial uh, sand traps to try to get people not to uh, create that velocity and therefore pump up the token price, but if your economy is dependent upon high velocity and you are dissuading that velocity, then ultimately you're just undermining the functioning of your token. So that's also not good. And then discounting. The great thing about MP, MV equals PT is that you can look forward, uh, it's forward looking. So you can derive the value of an asset at any point in the future by figuring out what is the size of the economy that it's going to disrupt uh, and working backwards from there. But if you figure out what the value of a token is five years in the future, you need to figure out how to discount that back to the present value so you can figure out what, it, what, what price it's actually worth investing in today. So let's go a little bit deeper into all of this. <clears throat> the white paper starting off. Does it need to be decentralized? Henry One, right on target, man. If it doesn't need to be decentralized, why, is it, why does it need a token? Right? The, token, the, the point of a token is to facilitate and incentivize decentralization. If you look at Bitcoin, you look at Ethereum, the originals, right? The token is the key upon which that decentralization is based. The trustless nature of it, the permissionlessness of it. Because the token itself holds that value, and the token underwrites the fact that everyone else is acting uh, in a manner that is... Uh, uh, <clears throat> contributing to the, the functioning of the economy. But if you have a centralized solution, then you already have a centralized party that's liable for whatever occurs, right? You don't need to make sure that every single individual is incentivized to, to, to behave trustfully because you already have a third party that's acting effectively as an arbiter. <clears throat> so also you need to move on, look at the specificity, right? If you're looking at a white paper, it's quite easy to say, oh, I'm going to disrupt the real estate market. It's a $200 trillion market, right? 
Huge opportunity, $200 trillion, big headline number. Well, you need to get deeper than that, right? You're not just going to create a token and disrupt a $200 trillion uh, market. You need to figure out a specific use case for your company, for your token, within that. And that should be written in the white paper. It shouldn't just be, hey, you know, we're going to tokenize everything. No, what are you tokenizing and why do people want it? Right? What is the specific thing within that vertical that you're tokenizing? I worked in real estate. I come from a real estate, private equity, and investment banking background. Um, and I can tell you, real estate is an incredibly ossified uh, industry. You come to people and you're like, hey, I'm going to disrupt this world. You know, look at me. I'm, I'm the best. And these real estate developers, they say, well, I made billions of dollars in this existing economy. Why do I need you? Why do I even want you? I know how this works. I don't want to adopt this. Right? So you need to figure out how to incentivize those individuals, and that needs to be in the white paper. You can't, it can't just be, look, we're going to decentralize and it's going to work. You need to figure out how you're going to incentivize all of the different individuals, all the different parties in these uh, economies that you're trying to disrupt. The tokenomics, this, I touched on this earlier, does the token serve a useful purpose uh, in the use case? Are you incentivizing the participants to actually use your solution, and then furthermore, are you incentivizing them to behave uh, in a beneficial manner. And then, of course, the team quality. Do they actually have domain-specific expertise? Is it a real estate guy who is going to raise a cryptocurrency fund? I don't know if that's something. I mean, I'm a real estate guy. I like investing in crypto, but would I trust myself to manage millions of dollars of other people's money doing it. I don't want to learn those lessons on somebody else's dime, right? Whoever you're giving your money to, because this is always an investment, they need to know what they're doing. They need several years of domain-specific expertise. And you need to be able to corroborate that expertise. We live in an incredible world where all of the data that's on the internet can be back-checked, right? You have LinkedIn, you have Facebook, you have all of these other avenues by which you can say, all right, you say that you've done these things, I'm going to go check and see if you've actually done what you say that you've done. If you can check all of these boxes off, then move on to the next thing, right? This is something that I wanted to touch on, which is uh, a troubling movement that I've seen in the ICO space, where instead of a utility token serving some sort of a purpose in a decentralized network, you have a utility token that is now a creator of friction. It's a creator of inefficiencies. These are the projects where the utility token serves no purpose other than as a membership token or as a payment rail, right? It doesn't actually create a decentralized network. It's just a way for them to say this isn't a security because you have to buy a membership to use our platform. Now, there are programs, because I, I don't want to, I don't want to be heavy handed here and blanket, uh, give a blanket, uh, dissuasion of, of all membership utility tokens, there are platforms that use a utility token as a membership model, but it needs to do more than that, right? I like REP, for instance. REP is one of my favorite decentralized platforms, right? In order to use the REP platform, um, in order to participate as an oracle, you need to have REP, right? And REP itself basically ensures that the individuals who are reporting on and maybe I should back up in case you all aren't all familiar with Augur. Augur is a prediction marketplace, right? And a prediction marketplace only functions correctly if you have individuals who are reporting on the outcomes of events truthfully. And that's what REP does. REP makes sure that anybody who is reporting on the outcome of an event, which will now have tons of money riding on it because it's a prediction marketplace, they're ensuring that those people are incentivized to report truthfully uh, on those events. But it doesn't simply serve as a membership token. Right? It serves another purpose. This is a bit of a, uh, uh, a pet peeve of mine, so please forgive me for spending a little bit too much time on it. Uh, moving on. So age, growth, network effect, right? How long has this token been in existence? Um, I like to use the example of NEO and A-Chain. Both are Chinese smart contract uh, platforms. They've both been around for a long time. I think A-Chain has actually been around for longer, right? And I remember about six months ago, people started coming to me and saying, oh, I found out about this thing, A-Chain. It's at 50 cents right now. It's going to go to a dollar. It's just like Neo." And I started researching it. And I said, well, A-Chain's been around for three plus years, right? And they don't seem to have accomplished very much. Whereas Neo, you know, tends to go gangbusters. They have a great marketing team. They make tons of, part of uh, partnerships. Um, 
and they've been creating a very interesting platform that has a bunch of dApps that are live on it, right? So you have to take into consideration how long has a project been around? Maybe you may have just heard of this project, but perhaps it's been around for quite a long time trying to pursue this use case and not succeeding, in which case it's probably not worth your time. Uh, penetration of, of a particular industry. This is an incredibly powerful metric if you can find this data. It's quite difficult right now to figure out, okay, how much of the remittance market is Bitcoin taking up, right? Um, is Litecoin replacing, you know, peer-to-peer uh, -peer transactions? How, how successful is the Lightning Network? Um, but there are certain projects like Ripple and others where they'll actually give you an idea of how successful they've been in penetrating the industries that they are uh, trying to disrupt. And this can help you quite a bit with the, um, the uh, equation of exchange because it helps you understand the demand side of it, right? We understand the supply, but ultimately, if they're not penetrating these industries, then it's a significant lag on demand. The rates of growth in hardware, software, applications, and users. Uh, I like this one. It's a particularly interesting one because you're now mixing in hash rates, you're mixing in uh, actual development of the software itself, along with the number of dApps that are running on a, uh, a particular uh, smart contracting platform and the number of users who are using it, right? Hardware is the miners. The more miners that are protecting an ecosystem, the more the hash rate goes up. That's quite easy to measure. Uh, and miners are profit motivated. If more miners are protecting a, uh, a particular asset, then there's a good chance that they see some sort of value there. Um, on the software side of it, any project that's no longer innovating their software, which these are open source projects, if they're not open source, as Henry once said, you probably shouldn't be investing. But any project that has a dead GitHub is one that I would look at with extreme caution, right? This is a rapidly, rapidly changing marketplace. There's no one who came to market at any point since the creation of Bitcoin with a crypto uh, company who's created a foolproof software, right? If they stopped updating their software, then they're getting left behind. On the application side, this is, uh, I, I mean, I like this a lot because especially we're, right now we're in the middle of uh, basically the battle of the smart contracting platforms, right? I like to call it, you know, LaserDisc versus DVD, HD DVD versus... Uh, Blu-ray, it's the same thing, right? But you can actually see how many users, are you, how many applications are being built upon them, right? Neo, Ethereum, uh, Stellar, uh, soon EOS, I, I believe, is going live. Tezos, if they ever figure their stuff out. Uh, but you can see how many dApps these ecosystems are supporting, um, and thereby how much demand there is for their platform and for the tokens that are associated with it, right? And then users, you can see that typically with transaction velocity. Um, not specifically transaction velocity, but just transactions, right? On these open source blockchains, um, you can see the transactions. You can see what the transaction volume is for any given point of time. And if it's trending upwards, I mean, that's a, a clear and strong indicator that this is a good investment. Uh, I touched on this a little bit before. This is something that uh, I'm actually working on with the students at the University of California at Irvine. We're trying to put together a program to basically track specifically the dev activity and the community involvement. Um, one of those being GitHub, right? If you can track the activity in the GitHub and then also try to figure out qualitative measures of that activity, right? How many contributors are there who are contributing to the code on the GitHub? If there's only one person, uh, then it, you know, that's not a good sign. It means that, uh, Developers are not being attracted to the platform to improve it. Good developers attract more good developers. The more developers that there are building on a platform, uh, the better the indication that this is good code uh, and this is a good project. The number of stars, that's a similar, uh, a similar idea where a star is effectively somebody has highlighted a piece of code and pointed it out and said, this is good code. This is something that I want to reference or build on in the future. And the number of forks, also similar, right? Zcoin, Litecoin, these are all forks of Bitcoin. 
if people are forking off and trying to build their own code, that's a good indicator that this is solid code and people now want to build their own projects uh, off of it. On the social media side, God, social media in the crypto sphere is just a cesspool. Um, I alluded to this earlier, when moon, where's my Lambo? You know, this is big, I hate saying that. But Telegram, Slack, Medium, it's still an interesting indicator of how involved the community is if you can sort through all of that data, right? If you can figure out how to rank it by quality, you can look at, obviously, the activity. Are there tons of people posting? I don't know if any of you have ever used earn.com, um, or maybe it was earn.co now. But it's basically a website where you can get paid in Bitcoin in order to perform tasks. And ICOs realized that you could pay people a dollar in Bitcoin, and they would go sign up for your Telegram, sign up for your Slack, and just post in there, just say something, right? Which made it look like their Telegram and their Slack were incredibly active, and they had incredible community involvement. But you went in there, and it was just nonsense verbiage, you know, just people talking so that they could get their one dollar. Uh, so you need to figure out, you know, look at these telegrams, look at these slacks, and weed through the noise and see, all right, is it mainly just people posting some, some you know, inane conversation to get their dollar, or is it people who are actually trying to generate important conversation around whatever this is, right? Whatever it is that they're trying to, uh, trying to disrupt. Um, and then the number of unique participants, um, that's a tough one, but you know, there are obviously tons of bots uh, it's quite easy to Sybil, your Telegram slacks, uh, medium comments, whatever. Uh, and so sorting through that is, it would be powerful if we could do it. I'm not sure if we can figure out how to do it yet. So back to MV equals PT, right? Supply, demand, velocity, discounting. <clears throat> so you need to figure out what is the size of the industry that's being, dis uh, that's being disrupted. Um, more importantly, depending on what the industry is, what's the size of the annual transactions, right? And this comes back to the velocity. If this Good. is right. gold, um, right? How would you define a chain? Did somebody ask a question? What was that? Uh. <laughs> uh, so, what is the annual transaction volume? So velocity, right? Velocity of gold is quite low. People buy gold to hold it, right? You could say that the velocity of gold is one. So in that case, what's the size of the industry? What is the total asset size of it? But something like remittances, well, there's high velocity in remittances, right? You can use the same dollar to remit multiple times. So in that case, you need to figure out what the transaction volume is, not simply the size of the entire industry. Um, velocity, like I was saying, very different, right? And this has an incredible effect on the ultimate value calculation because you're dividing by the velocity. <clears throat> the last estimated timeline for market penetration, if it's five years out, if it's 10 years out, if it's three years out, this has a strong effect on uh, what your present value is because you're going to have to discount back from whatever the value is that you create, right? $100 in five years is not worth as much to you today as $100 in a year. So I wanted to uh, basically give you guys a sample valuation, just an idea of how this all comes together um, before I, I uh, run out of time. So I use the remittance industry. It's easy to understand. Um, it's about a $500 billion annual uh, industry in terms of transactions, right? I assumed a velocity of five, which is about the average velocity of the US dollar, somewhere between five and six. Um, and I assumed five years it would take to reach 30% market penetration, which is $150 billion of annual transactions, right? The supply of Bitcoin in five years, approximately $19,500,000. So your Bitcoin value in five years, just based off of 30% penetration of the remittance industry, is $150 billion divided by the velocity, which is five, divided by the total supply of Bitcoin which gets you $1,540 per Bitcoin, right? You discount that by 30% to the present value, which gives you a present value of $414. Um, I wanted to include this because I thought it was actually kind of illustrative of how difficult this can get, right? Because I made a number of assumptions here, right? First of all, I made a mistake. 
500 billion in annual transactions is probably much more in five years, and I didn't increase that, so I apologize. The velocity of five, I use the, the, uh, the average velocity of the US dollar, but that is not necessarily applicable to this, right? It's probably better to use the average velocity of a Bitcoin, which for 2016 was six and a half, right? That means that every Bitcoin in circulation transacted about six and a half times uh, throughout the year of 2016. But that calculation doesn't take into account the fact that roughly 50% of Bitcoin is hodled, right? So only 50% of Bitcoin is actually transacting. So six and a half is actually not the correct uh, velocity. It's probably closer to 12, 13, or 14, right? Uh, the uh, five years to reach 30% market penetration, right? I mean, there, there's a whole bunch of research that has to go into finding that number, right? You can't just say that these things are going to happen. So it takes an incredible amount of uh, fundamental research to underlie every single assumption that is in uh, this calculation. Um, and so that's part of the reason, I think, that we haven't seen uh, these sorts of valuations become very widespread uh, because these are such nascent industries and each of these uh, questions, you know, it's, it's easier to figure these out for Bitcoin because Bitcoin's been around for 10 years, but for each of these ICO tokens, each of these new crypto assets, which has six months, nine months, 12 months of history for you to analyze, it's quite difficult to take those, you know, six months of data and project out five years or 10 years and come up with any sort of an actual, you know, solid valuation um, that you can then discount back. Um, so it's a work in progress, you know. It, it's a baseline that we can certainly build off of. It's something that uh, I build off of at Digital Asset Advisors. It's something that we're trying to create more transparency around in, in conjunction with UCI. Um, but it's a challenge, you know, it's a challenge. These are not like traditional equities where you have cash flows that you can discount to uh, present value or you have, you know, well understood metrics. Uh, or even just normal disclosures, right? This whole argument, uh, this whole conversation that's going on between securities and utilities, right? I mean, even if we find uh, a, uh, a way for tokens to remain utilities and not have to comply completely with securities laws, I think that we will need to move in the direction of further disclosures because it's incredibly difficult for you to figure out a solid valuation for any of these crypto assets if you don't have the kind of disclosures, the kind of data that you find in any other traditional capital market. Um, and so I think as this market matures and investors uh, move from retail to a more institutional bent, they're going to start demanding this from these projects. They're going to say, you know, as, as uh, you know, Henry One's fund says, look, these are, these are the, the things that, that you need to comply with in order for us to invest, and disclosures are going to be one of those things. Um, the last thing I wanted to leave you all with was uh, a list of some of the um, resources that I use when I'm trying to, uh, to figure out the present value of some of these projects. Um, there are even more, but this is a good place to start. Uh, I also want to give acknowledgement to uh, uh, Chris Bernisk, whose book, Crypto Assets, um, and his Medium channel has been absolutely invaluable in uh, informing my own knowledge and my own uh, forays into this space. Uh, and so if you want to dig deeper into this, I would highly suggest uh, either reading his book or going on his Medium, uh, his Medium channel and reading his posts as well. But yeah, that's it. I uh, really appreciate being here. I want to thank Iskander for inviting me and having me here. This was a pleasure.